So what Andy was doing with, uh, he was doing photographic screen printing, but it wasn't about it needs to be absolutely perfect. He was actually purposefully using more or less ink on different ones because while he wanted you to be able to have that Campbell's soup picture at your house, he, want, he understood that art is a form of uniqueness, right? So he wanted you to have a unique piece of that art and he didn't want every single one to be identical. We live below the fold. We live underneath those incredible brands. What is the vision? Right? So like there's a story, but then it's like, where are you trying to go? If it's compelling enough, then you start to get people to believe in it. All right, guys, we're back. We're with the talent here at, at, uh, at Culture Studio. I'm excited to have this episode here. We're going to talk about some history, some history of screen printing. So for all you history nerds out there that like to go back and reflect and kind of see where things come from, this is gonna be a good episode to really dive into the history of screen printing. But but first, before we dive into some of that stuff, um, you know, we have the rock stars here, Tyler and Emma, welcome to the show. Yeah, Hi, thanks. thanks for having us. Yeah, I feel like you guys should be the one interview, interviewing because you guys are the, the <laughs> matter experts at all things screen printing so i think uh we could have an episode just on talking to you guys about about your journeys um, but you know what man before before we dive into all that maybe that would be a good way to start like tell us a little bit about your journey in screen printing because i think it's always an exciting an exciting and interesting story of how people even get into this industry none of us went to school for screen printing right or like mm -hmm. none of us really like thought this was going to be the industry that we landed in and and ended up in so there's always an interesting story of how we got here so maybe we can start with each of you telling us your journey in the screen printing world so i started screen printing actually when i was about 15 years old um, i went to an arts high school in houston texas and the minute i did it i fell in love with it and i knew it was something that i wanted to do for the rest of my life um, so i ended up actually going to school for printmaking um, and, uh, you yeah. Did go to yeah, I did. I did go to school. For it. That's why we brought her in for the history, <laughs> yeah. man. She's the she, she's the okay. history buff. The, yeah. The, yeah. So I, I've been screen printing ever since I could work. Um, you know, I went to school for it. And when I wasn't in school, I was printing. I was printing at work. I was printing at home. And now I work here and I print here. It's great. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Tyler, how about you? Tell us your story. Yeah, so my uh, my story starts here at Culture Studio, actually. So I was uh, growing up, I was always into skateboarding and music, and you know those two kind those two things kind of go hand in hand with screen printing. Um, so yeah, I skated in here one day and knocked on the door and was looking for an opportunity. And I think you actually interviewed me that day, Carlo. I was all sweaty. It was August. I had a flannel shirt on and. Uh, yeah, so I interviewed with you and I got the job and then I just absolutely fell in love with the process, just making art, the, the people that we were printing for, uh, the big names in the music industry as a musician myself just made me fall even more in love with what we do here. And uh, so now it's been about 10 years. It's been a 10 year marriage going on here. Yeah, marriage, that's the right way to, that's the right way to put it. Ups and downs, but you know, you gotta, you gotta work at it and evolve, so. Oh, great stories. And I do remember that day you skated in here, you know, young buck, wide eyed young buck. And uh, it's cool to look back 10 years and just see the development and the growth where, where we were, where you were even as, as, a, as a person, as a young person and where you're at today. Now, um, a subject matter expert in this in this industry. It's, it's cool to see. Um, but, you know, like even even myself, like starting into this industry, a lot of people don't even know what screen printing is. Like, where, where does it come from? Like, you know, like there's does it just come from China and like t-shirts come from China and you blink your eyes and it shows up in a box? Um, yes, in many cases that, that is the case, but really what is, what is the history behind and how is it made? Actually on the way into, into work today, which is kind of a fitting time to do it. I was listening to the story of the luxury brand Hermes. You guys know that brand, right? And I mean, it goes, it goes way back. I think they started in 1836. So it's one of the oldest luxury brands out there. And as they were, they were telling the story, they started saying that, you know, they started off creating like luxury 
saddles for horses, like really nice leather saddles. And that's how they, they, got, they got into the, I guess you can call wearables business. Um, of course, the, the story goes, they start making handbags and some of the best handbags ever. But I guess one of the best sellers they had in their journey was a screen printed scarf on a silk scarf, 12 colors, hand screen printed. And back then it was like, this is the most beautiful piece of art they've ever seen. So it's cool to see how far screen printing goes and how far back it goes. Um, but let's dive into a little bit of like what you guys know of the research that you've done in just how far back this goes and some of the history. Yeah. 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 So printing, there's like the, the two different lanes of printing, right? There's like the paper printing and, you know, like word presses and that kind of thing, which is where newspapers started to become popularized and that stuff. Um, what we'll focus on more so is kind of like the artistic screen printing where we're actually like talking about producing images and art, right? Because it's a little bit different than, you know, just creating the words. The, the words were essentially like a stamp, right? That's kind of how everything started. That's how almost like printing in general started with woodblock printing and that kind of thing is like they would carve stencils into the wood and then they'd use color to stamp images. Um, and that's really like the earliest form of like printing, like transfer printing in that way. But stencils go back even to like, like Egyptian times of like, they would take their hands and they would use blood and different colored things to kind of like, put their mark onto the land, right? So like, that's like stencils go back that far, but stencils as it relates to screen printing started with the Song Dynasty, right? Mm -hmm. Basically like, uh, sure did. which is, what, what, what is their era, 1960? 960. 960 AD. Uh, 1279 AD, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're taking it back there. So what, what is the, you said Song, what, what is that? So it, that's uh, China yep. um, and, <laughs> It's kind of it's a little bit gross, but kind of interesting. Um, they before they were using uh, silk, they actually used woven hair to make the screens and push the ink through the screens. It's pretty crazy because it was durable and you know readily available. Interesting. So that's what they would use to make. So like the silk and silk screening would be hair, mm -hmm. <laughs> hair follicles was yeah. what it was at first. Oh wow, that's yeah. That's and so that actually the Song Dynasty is actually credited for the first civilization to introduce like paper money. And they were using woodblock printing to print paper money, uh, not, not far off from what we do today, to be honest with you. And so they were really like, they really made a lot of advances in technology and civilization. And a lot of what they did kind of set the precedent for how we do things today in regards to money, in regards to art, in regards to just life. Awesome. Yeah. The, the printing of money. That's, I guess in some, in some shape, we're still printing money. You know, we're not printing the actual dollars, but what we're printing is a form of, you know, capitalism and we're out there selling. And so in, in a way that's still printing of money. Um, well, cool. Like, so, you know, like there, there's so much history and I, I, I always think of when someone mentions screen printing, many times people think of Andy Warhol, right? Like they say that he created it. He created screen printing. Of course, it goes a little a little further back than him. Uh, what do you guys know of, of that story or kind of what he brought to the table when it when he entered in with screen printing products? So it, a lot of people credit uh, Andy Warhol for, you know, the pop art movement and like really popularizing screen print um, kind of in the beginning of the 60s. Um, you see his prevalence really uh, coming to the forefront of the art world, right? So with the introduction of the factory, you had Andy Warhol's pieces being made on a such a large scale production um, that kind of was unheard of in the art world beforehand, right? Like before that, you would more so see paintings being sold not in multiples so that artwork was a cheaper and b like easier for anyone to get which is like a huge shift in the art world that, and and with commerce and capitalism in general that campbell soup that campbell soup, campbell soup. Uh, art man that's the that's the one that really is like the the go-to in everyone's brains 
Um, and yeah, the factory. So the factory, like you mentioned, was like Andy Warhol with all of his pals and all these artistics would just hang out and kind of party there. And it wasn't like a factory in the sense of like a bunch of workers clocking in, right? Punching the clock and like getting to work and doing their assigned duties. It was just a bunch of creatives hanging out, you know, kind of getting messed up on, on different drugs or alcohol or whatever. And just trying to advance art, just trying to advance, um, how we look at things, you know, and how creative we can be. So what Andy was doing with, uh, he was doing photographic screen printing, which he was, he was the forefront of that, right? And so what he would do is take pictures and he would send those photos to laboratories to develop large format, like large scale acetate film negatives. And he would use those film negatives to develop a screen, right? And so like nowadays we're used to these coding troughs and everyone's got an auto coder. They're coding by hand with like beautiful troughs and this kind of thing, right? Back then they were just painting emulsion onto the screen. So you just paint that emulsion on there. You have no EOM, you have no, no stencil thickness, no control over it, right? But it wasn't about it being so controlled. It was about that mass production in a, to a degree but it wasn't about it needs to be absolutely perfect. He was actually purposefully using more or less ink on different ones because while he wanted you to be able to have that Campbell's soup picture at your house, he want, he understood that art is a form of uniqueness, right? So he wanted you to have a unique piece of that art and he didn't want every single one to be identical. And that kind of harkens back to a, um, a form of printing that was used before that called the monotype right which mono meaning one you only get one print from this and it's ran through uh like a crank press right that gets pushed with like pressure right so it's i don't know i kind of feel the similarities between those two things yeah yeah absolutely and so like andy was like in in pop america he's credited with a lot but realistically, like back then, it was um, Samuel Simon. He was, the, he was out of England. And so he was the one that actually took screen printing and kind of made it into, a, uh, into like a commodity or into like a capitalist venture because he realized that he could screen print signs much faster than people could paint them, right? So people were hand painting signs and stuff like that. And this guy was basically, he basically patented what we recognize as screen printing today, like the process that we use today. And so what that did, that was around the time of World War I. And that launched that propaganda era. So you had people printing posters, screen printing all these different posters and all of this art. And because it was a cheaper way than just like making it by hand one by one, they were able to launch propaganda and put all of these things out like, Rosie the Riveter, right? I think that's World War II. But um, that's when it really started to pick up and gain steam was during World War I because of uh, Samuel Simon. Awesome. When is that, like 19, early 1900s? So, yeah, 1907 was when he patented. The, basically, the print process that everyone recognizes as screen printing today, he patented that in 1907. And I think World War I was like 1914-ish. Um, so by then people had already become kind of accustomed to screen printing signs and like, like even like, uh, lower end businesses, right? Like a grocery store yeah. or what have you, they could now afford more signs, more advertising. Right. They could put their stuff out there because they don't need to hand paint it. And it gave brand recognition, right? Because they had that same logo, that same color on every single one. And it looked a lot more consistent and that then imp imprints in your brain, you know, as like a brand identity more so. Exactly. Yeah. So it was like you see these posters and these signs up on every like like billboards today. Right. You see the uh, the crazy Kaplan's right. Everyone in Chicago, when you're going when you're leaving and you're going towards Indiana or wherever you see crazy Kaplan, crazy Kaplan, crazy Kaplan. And that was what was happening for small businesses in the States at that time. They were able to create something that you would see hundreds of times. So it was so recognizable. Right. So in a way with screen printing and starting to make that more industrial on came some of the, the marketing opportunities as well. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. That's cool. Super interesting. You know, you guys keep talking about 
you know, there's so much artwork and one of one and this kind of like, you know, there's a lot, a lot of specialty that goes into the screen printing world, right? And that's something I think all of us as screen printers, as we now are 2024, it's like, there's still a lot of beauty in that. It's still an yeah. art form. Like we're still, you guys are talking 1907, we're 2024 and it's still an art form. But how do you get the clients and the public to understand that it still is an art form, right? Like back to the Hermes thing, they were talking about like, you know, that they have their own orange. It's not even, it's not even a panto. They, 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 they created their own orange. It isn't a Pantone color. Um, and I think at some point they went to court uh, overseas where they're trying to own orange, like anything orange would, would go back to them. Uh, but one thing that they said was that even the orange printed on different types of leather came out a different orange. So it wasn't always the same color orange because of the different substrate. And I know we deal with that every single day, right? Whether we're printing black or we're printing on, and the client gets in, they're like, well, this isn't the orange Pantone I called. Well, it is actually the, the correct Pantone, but on a different substrate is coming out. Back then it's an art form. Today, reprint my shit because it's incorrect. Right, yeah, people are out of touch with the art form, right? Like people are looking at it because it's now so commercialized and it's so much into the capitalist movement and all of that, right? It's like, I want my design to look exactly like it does on the computer screen and I want it on three different substrates. And it's like the whole reason screen printing started was as that art form, like Andy Warhol who popularized it, he wanted each piece to be unique, you know? So there is a beauty in that. It's like, you're getting something that's handcrafted. No matter how much automation goes into it, it's still a handcrafted product. Even though you're on an auto, even though you've got an auto coder or a, or a, a DTS machine or whatever, um, it's still very much a craft and a hands-on project. So it's hard to, I think that's kind of where my specialty comes in in my role at Culture Studios, trying to explain that to people in a way that you know, it actually resonates because you can't screen print on all these different substrates and expect that digital mock-up. I mean, first of all, you're looking at, at it on a screen and it's not actually been realized at all. It, it, realistically, it's a theory at that point. When it's on your monitor, it's only a theor theory. The real product is what matters, you know? And so it's just educating people. And obviously we always do our best, right? Like we put our best foot forward make it look exactly like that digital mock, do it across all different substrates. Um, but really the best is just when clients listen to us about use this substrate instead of that one, because then it will look perfect. It'll look exactly like you're expecting. Right. You kind of have to consider though, like, yes, it is a craft and it, it is an art form, but it's also a means of production, right? I feel like there's a pretty big difference between, you know, the, the, the Andy Warhols of today who are utilizing screen print to make artwork versus people who utilize screen print to make a product, right? You, people's expectations with a product is that everything has to be the same and perfect because it is a product that right. someone is going to pay for, right? There is an ebb and flow there and it's hard to, it's hard for people to understand that because it all starts as art, right? right? Like digitally, as you're creating it, it starts as art and then it turns into this product and this production and all of these things. And really, ultimately, it's an imperfect process. Mm -hmm. Like everything you like, like people were using hair, right? We're, <laughs> we've advanced from there, but not as far as you think, right? We, we used, started using different. silk and now, now we use like polyester, yeah. like, like fabrics and stuff like that to use it. But it's not that different. It's mm -hmm. just, you get a little bit of a finer weave, you know, you get a little bit of a, and you know, you can control it to a certain degree, but understanding that it is supposed to be art, right? It is a product, yeah. but it starts as art and it needs to like, like, I, I think that there's a big, um, a big misconception from people that don't work on the art side of what the expectation should be and the lack of appreciation of the art form itself. Yeah, I guess that could be the objection to when anyone is looking for perfection, the objection is that this is an art, right? And of course there's limitations. You can't go, you can't go too far. It can't, it can't be one orange and a completely different orange on the other one. You can only use that in your back pocket so much to your point, Emma, it is production products that we're pushing out. Um, but like that is like, we should all tap into our craft. Remember the history that this is supposed to be art. 
no two pieces are supposed to look alike, right? So we could keep that a little bit while keeping up the production flow. Um, you know, one thing, you know, we can kind of finish off on this is through your research, like when was the first t-shirt printed? Who, who sold the first piece, of, piece of merch? Did you guys get into any of that? Or like when the first piece of merch was printed, the first t-shirt? You know, that's a really good question. And I feel like a lot of people would argue, I printed the first t-shirt, yeah. you know? Yep. Um, it's Honestly, uh, I feel like it would have to be somewhere in China, you know? Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, it started in, so like Japan back yeah. in, uh, you know, the 1500s or whatever it is, they were doing it on kimonos. Yep. So it actually, the first kind of fabric that started to get printed was on kimonos, and that was through the, the means of the Song Dynasty. So they're taking hair, they're stretching it, and then they're using, they're gluing paper, right? So they would glue paper instead of emulsion, and that's how they would get their stencil. Um, so they'd use a waterproof piece of paper or whatever. So, and it wasn't really, I guess they did sell them back then, but really that's like when the first fabric was printed was back in like the 14, 1500s in Japan. Very cool. You heard it here first. The first piece of merch ever printed was a kimono. Yeah. <laughs> Carlo's going to try to find it on eBay for sure. Yeah. He's, he's hunting for it. It's not me. You know, Rich is wearing a kimono. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's probably got it on right now. You're going to have to buy it from him, man. Rocking it right now in Florida. Well, this is a great history lesson. I think it's always good to go back and pay tribute to kind of the process and where it went. Let's all remember that this is artwork and it's supposed to be an art form. And let's all tap into our creativity. So merch culture, I hope that was that was good for everybody. Thank you, Emma and Tyler, for coming on. That was awesome. Yeah, buddy. Thanks for having us.